Nga koutou katoa, ko Fiona Toku Ingoa, no Ototai Aho. Uh, I'm CE for Education Outdoors New Zealand, uh, so a warm welcome um, to you uh, for today. Uh, there'll be a few more people popping in, no doubt, um, but we'll get started um, nice and promptly. Um, so we'll leave some time at the end for questions. Uh, Just uh, get started with karakia. Uh, tūtā mai i runa, tūtā mai i rō, raro, tūtā mai i rōto, tūtā mai i wāho, ki a tau ai te modi tū, te modi ora ki te katoa, humie, huie, tahikie. So come forth from above, come forth from below, come forth from within, come forth from the environment, vitality and well-being for all, strengthened in unity, bond together. Uh, just a few quick things. Um, lots of you have already been on these sessions, uh, so feel free to use chat or put your hands up. Uh, not too many people on today, so um, feel free to come off mute and ask questions um, along the way. Just check that you are on mute. Um, we've had a couple of um, close to embarrassing office incidents where people haven't realised that they're not on mute. Uh, so always pays to check. Uh, and just a quick reminder about the National Incident Data, uh, National EOTC Coordinator Database uh, before we kick off. Uh, most of you will have come to this webinar through that database information, um, but we really appreciate um, any time you can spread that message and get uh, your neighbouring schools onto that database. Um, it's free, takes a couple of minutes, and it just means... Uh, uh, we get information out to um, one email address within the school, which is really helpful. So today, looking at competent supervision and how we make judgments and keep records around um, competence and um, setting up supervision structures. So absolutely critical um, to safety in EOTC and Often the supervisors uh, that we're giving roles to for EOTC, uh, those competencies and roles are quite different to what they normally do um, every day in the classroom. So it really pays to have good processes for identifying what the competencies are, the activity requires and then um, matching up your staff with those competencies and volunteers in that picture as well. Um, you're asking those uh, staff and volunteers to manage students in really quite dynamic environments, uh, actively uh, look at risk and hazards during the whole activity, and that whole piece around emergency management. Uh, often with EOTC, we plan for businesses normal or usual, when we really should be considering and planning for what happens if there is an emergency. Uh, I used to be uh, in charge of relief in my last high school, and uh, I was very aware there's super competent classroom teachers who I would not give PE relief to, just because of the difference of managing that dynamic environment outside of the four walls of the classroom. Uh, in your leadership positions, um, you have the skills and experience to make those judgments. So part of your professional judgment um, is that leadership skill. Um, but you do need to be mindful um, about making those judgments on competency and trusting your gut when you're not sure. Uh, sometimes it's easy to make assumptions and uh, put people into roles that they don't have the competencies for. Uh, you know, just because they've been doing it for years doesn't mean they're the best person for that role. So some strategies around building competence. And often we don't think about EOTC training as part of professional development, um, but there's some really um, good options in there for developing people professionally um, for managing in those more dynamic environments. 
and also thinking about the concept of when they're starting out as a leader in EOTC, um, making sure that they're safe to fail. Um, so the concept of safe to fail was that we can have failures and learn from failures without serious consequences. For example, uh, failing uh, some think around group management uh, when we've got uh, a group at a local park is very different to having that failure um, when we're running a swimming activity at the beach. So being mindful when people are starting out on their EOTC journeys, okay, what uh, might be appropriate environments and activities for them to learn on. Uh, and always the concept that it's your people that create the safety and your systems are there to support them doing that. So looking at this picture of how we decide what competencies are required for each EOTC event or activity that you deliver. Uh, and this process that we're going to talk about today starts with the EOTC event rather than the person. And that removes some of those assumptions that we can easily make. Like I talked about before, like they've been running for this for years. Of course, they know what they're doing. Um, and this is a piece of work that you can um, do at the start of the year or the end of the year uh, on the activities you're likely to have the following year. Uh, allows you to do it in one go, which is really great for consistency between activities. And then it becomes much quicker when you get a new EOTC approval coming onto your desk. Uh, so in the new EOTC coordinator toolkit, there's a um, a form and a system that helps with that. That's form number two in the EOTC coordinator toolkit. And it looks like this. So a range of headings along the top. Uh, the key ones um, are really at the back here when deciding on what the competencies are that are going to be required for the particular activity. Now, if there's a qualification that is appropriate, what experience is required. And also this idea that there might be some student competencies um, that are required. Now, uh, what I would do and um, how I worked this um, when I was still at school um, was I sent, created this as a Google form and sent it out to all HODs or heads of faculty or syndicate leaders and um, get them to fill in their thoughts on what um, EOTC activities or events they're running and what they think around the qualifications and experience that might be required to run those events. And that will give you a really good start uh, to this piece of work. Uh, Google or Microsoft um, pulls it all back into a nice spreadsheet that you can get started on. You might want to um, play around with the headings and that's completely up to you. you. It's got to make sense for the type of activities you do at school and, and how your school is set up. Uh, so a couple of examples to talk about. Uh, first one I thought about here was going down to the, the nature reserve. Uh, good primary school example. Uh, this is what happens at my son's primary school. Uh, that's a block away and it's got a road crossing. Um, if we think about what's involved uh, for the supervisors and managing that, uh, they need some good student management in a dynamic, changeable environment. Uh, they will have to deal with people, with dogs, uh, some weather, some wildlife, and some ducks and swans down there, um, and some random driver behavior behavior pop, uh, possibly uh, as they cross those roads and then there's the ability to respond to the emergency appropriately um, that's calmly and following a procedure that you've got laid out to them and then when I look at the activity what does the activity actually require uh, someone down there needs to have some first aid qualifications um, probably a 
the most appropriate student management qualification is actually a teacher qualification. There could be some other qualifications depending on what they're doing down there or um, some other experience because it might not just be all about qualifications. Uh, next example, into straight off into senior outdoor education, um, into quite a technical activity. Again, um, the supervision role requires that student management aspect and the responding to emergencies, but then the activity itself requires um, external qualification um, in most cases, or, or the equivalent. Uh, so that's a Nazoya or the outdoor. New Zealand Outdoor Instructors Association qualification is the one that I um, noted there. And a driver's license, but then with that experience about towing trailers and driving on gravel roads, if that's where they're going. And another experience thing um, is the weather knowledge. For some qualifications in the outdoors, that will be tied into the qualification. Um, for others, it may not be. Uh, now, one thing particularly uh, with these external qualifications is it's kind of important to note that they're a really good way of judging competency, but they are just one part of that picture. And that these qualifications do take time and effort um, and money, um, but you know, they need to because the consequences of failure in these types of environments um, are serious. So investing in um, staff or uh, external support that have rigorous qualifications um, is really important. And we'll have a look in a minute about some organisations that can support you with that. So here's a quick example of pulling that competency information into the spreadsheet idea. So you can just see um, how I have done that. Um, the, the risk level and the environmental factors here, just another way to kind of focus in on um, particular activities. And this is an example here where actually there are some student competencies required before they go on this river trip. Um, so they need to have been to the pool and the beach sessions and they need to have achieved the skills in those sessions um, before they um, go on this trip. So not only thinking about staff and volunteer competencies, um, but in this case, also thinking about student competencies that might be required to keep that activity running safely. So building this picture of uh, what competencies are required for your different events and activities, um, there's a number of ways to do that. And I'm just going to flick off um, slideshow now and pop over onto uh, some websites so we can show you exactly where some of these things sit. So bear with. So the first one here is a support adventure website and you can find these um, links all off the EONS website as well under EOTC management and what you're looking for on the sport adventure website and the EONS link will take you straight to the right page uh, but it's this good practice tab and in here this is where all of the good practice guidelines sit for a growing number of activities and there's two parts to these we've we've looked at these before there's the planning template which is really helpful um, in the risk assessment and supervision space. Uh, but the one we're going to look at today is the good practice guideline part of each one of these. And I've opened this up to camp cooking and fires. Uh, 
And you can see it's got a whole section on leader competency. So within each good practice guide, this session, section exists and it gives you an idea about kind of the skills and knowledge that are needed and if there's any relevant qualifications. Um, so this is a really good starting place when you've got your list of activities, pop into the good practice guides, see if one exists or something similar exists to the activities you've got planned and see what it says around leader competency. For the higher level activities, activities that are covered by yeah, the adventure regulations, there's activity safety guidelines. Uh, and some of these will be relevant. Uh, unlikely that you're going heli skiing. Um, so these won't have as much relevance as the good practice guides. Uh, some of you will have indoor climbing walls. Uh, some of you definitely going mountain biking, although this is higher level mountain biking. Uh, so there are definitely relevant ones in here. And if we click on to the indoor climbing, similar setup around outlining what competencies a staff member running that particular um, activity might need. Talks about qualifications, variants, things. So that information is there for you. Another good source of information is the uh, New Zealand Outdoor Instructors Association. And they have a whole range of qualifications. Uh, again, kind of in that outdoors space, so more relevant to outdoor education than EOTC. Um, and what each one of these qualifications has is a scope and syllabus, which is super useful for working out the competencies that someone running that activity for you might need. So you can see this one I've clicked onto is the Bush Leader Scope. Uh, talks a little bit about what's in that scope and then gives some really good examples. Um, so an example that lots of people use down here or would go to visit down here, okay, Woolshed Creek on Mount Summers, really common school trip. Um, so you can see that that fits within this qualification, and then further down, it starts to talk about the competencies that person needs to run that activity. So a really good place to find information. And lastly, I just want to show you um, a VentureWorks website. This is more about training. Um, so they can provide um, qualifications, including qualification around EOTC um, and online, uh, online training um, that is relevant, particularly in that outdoor space, as well as in the EOTC space. Any questions at this stage on, on this little bit before I... Uh, stop in here and go back into our slideshow. So some other um, places to get information from um, are your networks or the Kahui Ako that you're involved in. Uh, you know, if you can put some time towards scheduling an EOTC discussion in that group, um, you could get eons to zoom in and answer some questions. You could email through questions uh, about what is kind of appropriate at what level. Um, we're we're really happy to help at any stage um, with any of those kind of discussions. So the next piece of this work is to start to look at what competencies your staff have. So we've done the activities, we've done that independently of the staff you have and now we're starting to look at what qualifications and competencies your staff hold. Uh, and recording those over time, including um, the 
their qualifications, the experience they have, and all the EOTC um, trips they lead or go on uh, allows you to make some really robust decisions when you're approving that supervision of EOTC events. And even more importantly, um, it starts to build up a history that you can pass on uh, if you change roles or if you leave school. So the next person that comes in to approve EOTC events um, isn't starting with a blank slate. Um, they can see who's done what within your staff, what competencies they have, what PLD they've been to over a period of time. Uh, again, um, turning this into a Google or Microsoft form um, to help create that initial spreadsheet, uh, making your staff do most of the work for you, and then it just becomes a, a cut and paste um, exercise every year. And you can see... Um, I've had a go at filling one in here so you can see the kind of things um, that might go on to here. Um, when they had their induction completed, that they've read the policies and procedures, uh, capturing their driver's license and when that's due, um, capturing any first aid and when that's due, uh, and then qualifications and also trying to track this kind of personal experience a wee bit as well, um, particularly for those higher level activities. Uh, here's the example for uh, going to the park. Okay. Things like, you know, they run the road patrol so they you can look at that and go, oh, well, the next person coming in can go, oh, yeah, they know about how to work around roads. Uh, they manage the school hockey team. They've been to the park heaps. So you can see starting to build a picture um, that they're competent managing students um, in dynamic environments. Oh, and they've been to the EOTC safety management workshops. Okay, so that picture um, is really useful. Here's one that once it's been pulled into uh, a spreadsheet, you can see starting to build that over the years. Um, comes a little tricky here with Google Forms, um, involves a bit of a cut and paste um, when you're sending out a Google Form because it, uh, it won't overlay. Um, so you'll get it back and have to cut it into, cut and paste it into the uh, main spreadsheet. But starting to really build a great picture of the competencies that staff member has. And then the kind of key part for this is when the event approval comes onto your desk, you do that matching exercise. So do the competencies you've identified for the activity, match those that are on that um, initial uh, form that's come up or planning that's come across your desk and in the supervision structure and you know do they match and you're looking for any gaps and then you can work out how to fill those uh, and when you're looking at the staff you're considering um, not only that information you've captured on them but their decision making and judgment capabilities that whole managing students um, and, and equally, you know, are students likely to follow their instructions in a different environment away from school? You know, this whole piece is a really vital part of the approval process uh, because it's staff competency and that supervision structure is so key to good, effective EOTC management. Uh, it's really important uh, that it's done in the best possible way. And this um, type of system is really good practice um, because it's very systematic. Um, you have documents and systems to support your decision making in that process. And again, kind of going back to that whole idea of uh, not making assumptions and this process supports you to not do that and to be mindful. Um, oh, okay. 
So uh, just a quick reminder um, before we go for questions, um, the next EOTC Zoom, C Zoom um, is set up now on that uh, EOTC management page on our website, uh, not till February. So that's, uh, yeah, term four. I mean, term one of next year. Uh, oh, here's the link um, to the good practice guides off our website and a little list of what they are. And now we have time for questions. 